particularly he and uh, one of the things I love that he said is y'all guys prayed for me and I really after that I just went home just went about my, about my life really kind of didn't even really think about it didn't concentrate on it didn't worry about it I just you prayed for me and I just went on about my life and uh, I believe you know we need to be that way we need to have that faith level that when somebody lays hands on us and prays for us that we just go ahead right on about our life we know that we've got the promises we know who God is we know in whom we have believed and we stand in faith and uh, I want to and boy, I just got it that quick. I got to change in direction. Something I talked about my uh, to my staff last week. But let me read you a scripture in Exodus chapter two. I'm sorry, Exodus chapter three. Very quickly, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked and beheld the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, "I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why the bush does not burn." So when the Lord saw that he turned aside and looked, God called to him in the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. Then he said, do not draw near this place. Take off your sandals from your feet for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Uh, Bruce is going to come take up offering real quick before I get wound up and forget what I'm doing. And uh, you need help? Here you go, okay. All right, he'll get it. So as he's coming around, if you got would give the all in the offering there, and thank you very much for being faithful in your finances. But let me go back to this. Let me ask you this quick question: What? Who was Moses before the bush? Now, I won't give you a lot of time to answer. I just want to give you a couple of seconds to think. Who was Moses pre-bush? And so I'll throw you out some uh, of my thinking. If you think about Moses before the bush, number one, he is a sinner. What we would call a sinner. He has committed murder and he is on the lamb. He's running to hide from Pharaoh because he knows when he goes back to Egypt, they're going to get him for murder. He has killed a man and he is running. So he's in the wrong place. He's not in the land of his calling. He's not where he's supposed to be. He's not with his people. He's far from where God had called him to be, far from what God had told him to do, and far from his destiny. He's in the backside of the desert feeding somebody else's sheep, taking care of somebody else's business, not his own. That's Moses. Lost, outside of his own comfort zone, out of his anointing, out of his ministry, completely hopeless. As a matter of fact, if you'll go back and look, he had had a son and he actually names that son Gershom, which means I am a stranger in a foreign land. So he was in such despair that he even names his son a stranger in a foreign land. That's Moses. And he goes, he's going along, he sees the bush burning, he turns aside and he goes up to the bush. And I want you to notice this. In the burning of the bush changed everything for Moses. Now I want to ask you a, a, a very, maybe a more simple question. What were the attributes of the bush? What kind of bush was it? We don't know because the Bible doesn't say, right? How tall was it? We don't know. Did it bear fruit? We don't know. Did it bear flowers? We don't know. Was it broken or was it standing whole? We don't know. Was its bark marred from rabbits and coyotes and wolves from the, out in the wilderness? We don't know. Had birds lit in its branches and done what birds do to branches? We don't know. Does anybody know absolutely anything about the bush outside of the fact that it was a bush? No. But I do want to throw, tell you one thing that we never think about with the bush. The bush had the ability to sustain fire. The bush was the catalyst for the fire of God, and it had the ability to sustain the fire of God. It was not consumed. It did not fall over. It didn't run. It didn't say, no, thank you, God. It was obedient in standing there and being still and allowing the fire of God to come on it, and it survived the fire of God, was not consumed. It did not. It, does anybody know where the bush is today? If you go take an Israeli tour, if you go over to the Middle East and you go over there, is there a big plaque somewhere with a little twig still sticking up out of the ground that says, here is the bush of Moses? No. 
made no name for itself, was not famous, has no memorial to it this day. All it had was the ability to stand under the fire of God. And because it carried the fire of God, it created a prophet that went out and changed the whole course of religious history. And so many times we get caught up in the idea of wanting to be Moses that we forget if it wasn't for a bush that could sustain the fire of God, there never would have been a Moses. And so many times we look at ourselves in the mirror and we always see are the broken branches and the missing bark and the stuff that the birds left behind like birds do. And all we see is the lack, the inability, and we never understand this. God says, I don't necessarily want you to worry about being Moses. I just want you to be the bush. Just position yourself in such a place that in your heart, if God chooses to ignite the fire on you, that you will stand there and allow the fire of God, which is, by the, by, by the way, let me just make the connection for you. I'm talking about the power of the Holy Ghost. I'm talking about the power of the Holy Ghost. I'm talking about you being in a place that there is someone around you that's lost, that's broken, that's sick, that's dying, that's hurting, that's not where they're supposed to be. They're living in darkness. They've committed crime. They're running from God. They're running from their self. They're far from their family. They have no hope, no help, and full desperation. And all of a sudden, you stand between them and darkness. And we get so worried about doing something wrong and not doing something right. And sometimes we get us so anxious that we lock up and shut down and we can't move for God because we're worried about being Moses and not worried about being the bush. And I want to say to every single person here tonight, don't worry about being Moses. Just submit to being the bush. If we will just submit to being the bush and say, God, in all my brokenness, in all of my lack, in all of my missing parts and pieces, in all of the mistakes I've made in all of my life, I will at least have the faith to stand still. And if you will cause the fire of your Holy Ghost to sit down on me, I will lift up my hands, I will worship you, and I will allow your consumption fire to set upon me so that it will draw those who are in darkness around me. Moses came in in hopelessness and he left with hope. He came in without a ministry. He went out with a ministry. He came in without an anointing. He went out without an anointing. He came in without a relationship with God and he went out hearing the voice of the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Why? Because a bush would stand right there in the middle of the desert in all of its lack and and all of its brokenness and all of its dried out condition and say, here I am, just burn me, burn me. And so I'll encourage everybody here tonight, be a bush, be a bush, be ready and willing to say, God, whatever it is, whatever it takes, whatever you want, just consume me with it. Just consume me with it. That's where the holy ground was. That's exactly right. You're standing and you're concerned. You're on holy ground. Yeah. When you look at it. Yeah. And I want to, Derek, I want you to stand up and testify. Uh, I want to put Derek on the spot. I've talked about being a bush. Today, uh, I had the opportunity to go with Derek and pray for a man that's sick and dying. Brother uh, Charles and I went with him. And I want you to tell them what you felt when you laid your hand on that guy's knee. You felt the power transfer from you to him. Yeah. <laughs> and see, and, and why? Why? What happened right there? A, a man decided to be a bush. A man looked at a situation and said, God, here in that situation is darkness. Right there is despair. Right there is hopelessness. Right there is a place that somebody needs help, needs hope, needs an anointing, needs a prayer, needs lifted up. And a, a bush said, here I am. Your anointing, you soot your anointing on me. If you will burn me, I will stand under the fire. I'll do what you've called me to do. I'll be obedient. I'll make that step. And when we will do that, 
in faith. Listen to me. I want to tell you, the bush had no power in itself. But the fire on the bush had all the power to change a man from what he was to what he had to be to get the job done. Moses came in one way, left entirely. And, and, and think about this. Moses came into a bush that was burning as a light. Moses left as the light. That light on that bush was so great. Moses walked out of, that, out of the presence of the burning bush. And he walked straight into the presence of Pharaoh as a burning bush. Carrying the voice of God and the power of God. Where did he find the voice of God and the power of God? Standing at the feet of a bush that was burning. Will you be a bush? Will you be a bush? Will you say to Father, here I am. Whatever it takes, whatever it costs. The fire, that consuming fire, will you be a bush? I hope so. I hope you'll say, here I am, Lord, yes. I just went and saw Moses Saturday night at Branson, and the burning bush is a big part of that play. It's a very powerful and very moving and really, really cool now that you're talking about it. This is the third time this week I've, this has come up. But the burning bush. One of my favorite uh, cartoon movie scenes is the burning bush in Prince of Egypt. Uh, you can actually look it up on YouTube. Look up Prince of Egypt, Burning Bush, and you can see just about a four-minute clip of it. Phenomenal. With all that said, let me get right back into my sermon for tonight on being justified by blood and righteous by grace. And uh, I know there's all kinds of things going on in the world. There is. Uh, today's Rosh Hashanah. We got September 23rd coming up. You got September 22nd. Uh, all kinds of stuff. I mean, if you watch the internet and YouTube and all that, you can find all kinds of stuff happening over the next three days. And uh, so I asked myself this question. If let's say the rapture was going to happen in the next five days, what did I need to tell you guys tonight? What would be the one thing I need to tell you guys tonight? And I think one of the things I need to tell you is you are righteous by blood and not by works. Amen. So I'm going to talk to you about that tonight. Be righteous by blood and not by works. So before I start this, I want to ask you a quick, to make us, we're going to make a quick list. I didn't get my board out tonight, but uh, we're going to just make a quick verbal list of the works that make us righteous. Quickly, like popcorn. What are works that make us righteous? Reading the Bible. Going to church. Praying. Fasting. Serving. Witnessing. Relationships. <laughs> Salvation. All of those are works that would make us righteous. If we really think about it, uh, we hit the big four, uh, praying, reading their Bible, uh, fasting, and attending church, and we probably call those big four. And listen, I'm going to throw out a, a, a scripture for you that's going to kind of make the hair stand up on the back of your neck, and you're probably going to want me to clarify this, but do you realize every single thing that you said could be said? And you said, wait a second. I can read my Bible and it be said. I can fast and it be said. I can go to church and it be said. And I want to read you a scripture and prove to you, yes, it could be. Listen to this scripture. And he, and this is Romans chapter 14, verse 23. And he that doubteth is damned if he eats because he ate not in faith. For whatever is not of faith is sin. If you're reading your Bible because you think it makes you righteous, that is not of faith. That is of sin. If you're fasting because you think your fasting is going to make you righteous, that is a fasting for works, and that is not of faith. It is sin. Hmm. Never thought about that, did we? Because you listen to me. There is righteousness in one way and in one way only. We are righteous by faith, not by works. And one of the reasons we just talked about sin a couple weeks ago, we talked about blasphemy. I know those are important subjects, but I don't like to talk about that stuff too much because it makes us sin conscious. Somebody quickly tell me, what does it mean to be sin conscious? What would you say, Heather? Always thinking about sin. Anybody in this room ever worried about sin? Yeah, only two people were brave enough to raise their hand. Everybody else was holding their breath. Because <laughs> I asked the question. 
Look, that's sin consciousness. Worrying about sin, thinking about sin, afraid you're going to sin. Can't do this because you might sin. Can't do that because you might sin. Can't go there because you might sin. That's sin consciousness. And we can become so aware of sin that it paralyzes us in this dark shadow. It's like living under the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and you're standing there, scared out of your mind, afraid that you might bump into a piece of fruit that you're not supposed to touch, and there are all around your feet are the stinking, the, the stinking fruit of the flesh rotting around us, and we're standing there paralyzed in fear, and we can't move because we're standing right under the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what that does, it creates in us a cauldron of guilt, condemnation, dread, self-loathing, regret, failure, uh, and this word that I absolutely hate, it absolutely will put you in a place where you will tell yourself a thousand times a day, I am unworthy, I am unworthy, I am unworthy, I can't be healed because I'm unworthy, I can't carry the fire because I'm unworthy, I can't pray for my neighbor because I'm unworthy, I can't visit people sick in the hospital because I'm unworthy, 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 it comes from sin consciousness. Being conscious of sin. If we stand under that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and we look up at that stinking fruit long enough, there is a scripture in Job that says, That thing which I feared has come upon me. If you be afraid of the boogeyman long enough, you'll find boogeyman. Right? If you're absolutely terrified of spiders, you'll see every spider in the neighborhood. They will stand out for you, look like they're that big around. Right? You'll notice all of them. If you're afraid of black cats, every black cat in the neighborhood will catch your attention. Why? It's because of sin consciousness. And that thing which we are afraid of will catch up with us. If you are just absolutely scared that you're going to drink too many beer, guess what? At some point you're going to put too many in your mouth. Why? Because that thing which you fear will catch up with you. The tree of life and its fruit of righteousness was lost with man in the garden, but it was found again at the cross. There was a tree of life. There was a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That was a tree of sin. And there was a tree of life. The tree of life was lost to man, was not found again until the cross. And listen to me, righteousness came into your life by the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross, not because of how much Bible you've read, not because of how many hours you've prayed, not because of how many days you have passed it, not because of how many times you've attended church. Righteousness comes upon men by the blood of Jesus Christ, not by works, but by grace. No other way does it come than by grace. Amen. So we figured out what sin consciousness is, thinking about it too much. What's its result? What did I just say? What's the result of sin consciousness? Amen. Sin. The result of sin consciousness is sin. And so let's answer this question very quickly. Why is faith, blood, righteousness so important? And here's why. Because once I believe in my righteousness, I can begin to live in righteousness. You realize you will never live and walk in full righteousness until you stop being sin conscious. You will not walk in full righteousness until you get past your sin consciousness. What, what's, the, what's the fine line between sin consciousness and, and wisdom? Not to... I'm not just drinking too many beers. I mean, the wisdom is not, and I don't drink beer, by the way. But, if, you know, what's the, what's the difference? What's the fine line between sin consciousness and, and wisdom? And wisdom, just not, is it beer? Do what? Faith. Faith consciousness. Yeah, the, the difference, the line between fear of sin consciousness or fear of sin and wisdom is this. Sin consciousness is always on my mind. I think about sin. I worry about sin. I'm always into sin. But faith righteousness, once I get faith righteousness, I build relationship. And what happens is when I'm doing that, when I am sin consciousness, I have works continually trying to draw me to righteousness. I'm trying to earn my righteousness by my works. I'm trying to stay away from sin, be perfect, don't go, you know, uh, walk right, spit right talk right, all those other things we all have to do. And we begin to look at that and we think, because of my sin consciousness, my works make me righteous. 
But when I get rid of my sin consciousness and I grab a hold of my righteousness by the blood of Jesus, what I find is my righteousness begins to change my works. I don't not drink too many beer because I'm afraid that it will cause me to be in sin. But what I do is I find that I don't drink beer because in, in my desire to be righteous, those things begin to fall away. Because I am a new creature in Christ Jesus. And so those things fall away. That's conviction. There's a difference between conviction and condemnation. But now I, it's not a fear inside, but I do not, absolutely do not want to dis, uh, please. Want to disappoint yep. the Father in any mm -hmm. way. That is, that I can feel, and I'm one of them people, if I do, and I know I've had sin, lost my temper, etc., I carry that. I'm just one of them people. I'm sorry. I carry it. I know I'm forgiven for it. And I ask forgiveness. I talk to you about it. But I still feel like I should. <laughs> because you're still sin conscious. It's because you're still sin conscious. You're still sin conscious. And again, remember, one of the fruits of sin consciousness is the word unworthy. Because, and why does the enemy want you to say unworthy so bad? Why does the enemy want you to look in the mirror every day and say unworthy? Why does he want you to remind yourself at first break, at lunch, at second break, on the drive home from work, when you walk into the bathroom in the, in the afternoon to get your fast shower for the evening? Why does the enemy want you every time you have three seconds alone to say in your head unworthy, unworthy, unworthy? And here's why. Because the only way he can prevent you from getting things from God is prevent you from asking God. Because if you ask, you shall receive. If you seek, you shall find. If you knock, it will be opened. And if he can get you to believe you are unworthy, he will stop you from going to the foot of Abba and asking. And if you ask, you shall receive. So I have an issue because I can't wrap my mind around the fact of like there's no right or wrong way to pray, read the Bible and all that. Yes. Why can't I wrap my mind around that? Because, like, I have the hardest time sitting down to pray and read my Bible because there's no right or wrong way to do it. There's, like, a million different ways you can do it. Yes, and so and this sometimes people, you know, how many of you in this room have actually thought, if God were to write, take a, the finger would show up on the wall and say, you must read 12 chapters a day. You must pray for two hours. You must take <laughs> communion three <laughs> times a year. <laughs> would that not make life easier? Yes, if we had the law, let's see, so what you just said to me was, if there was a law that I could follow, then I would be perfect, and I would make sure I did the law. Oh, wait, no, we tried that one already. We tried that one already. And see, and here's the problem. The enemy will, whenever we come out from under law, then the enemy will want to tell us, well, the freedom is chaos. Freedom is chaos. You can do it any way you want to. You can do anything, however you want to, whatever. And so in that, you know, and then so the enemy goes and takes it sometimes to the other extreme and tell you that your freedom is chaos because there is no law. And I will tell you this. The Bible says love him with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength, right? And so what you need to do is just establish how you want to love him. How do you want to love him? And begin to pursue his a relationship, as Tony said a while ago, begin to pursue a relationship with him and build your prayer time and your reading and all of those other things. Begin to build them into what a relationship would look like because if you're not real careful in your effort to make sure you're doing it right, you will turn your Bible reading, your prayer, your fasting, and all that other stuff, you'll turn it into works. Very quickly. And we've all been guilty of that. Yes. How many of you have ever said, I'm going to pray 30 minutes every single day. By the fourth day, you only prayed five. And then you were under such condemnation for the next five days, you didn't pray any. Yeah. yeah. Why? Because what you did was you turned freedom and righteousness into a law, a self-imposed law. And when you broke the law, you fell under condemnation. And because you are under condemnation, you moved away from the cross instead of to the cross. Haven't we all been there? 
When we get so so the question is, what do I do with that, right? That's the question. What do I do? If I you know, how do I make myself get into this routine? And again, let me tell you the answer is there is no answer. We just have to embrace the fact that there is no answer because my, I have built a relationship with my wife entirely different than Mark built his relationship with Jacqueline. But my relationship with my wife is absolutely no better or worse than Mark's relationship with Jacqueline because it was built two different ways. He didn't court her the way I courted Belinda. You know, they didn't go the same places. They haven't lived in the same places. We, you know, it's been entirely different. But there, it is still a strong covenant relationship between him and his wife, between my, me and my wife. And it was built how we built it. And so I will tell you, you build your relationship with Abba. There are certain things that it needs to have in it. It needs to have reading your Bible. It needs to have prayer. It needs to have some fasting seasoned in there. It needs to have love thy neighbor as thyself. There's a lot of things that need to be in there, but they need to be in there because of a hunger for relationship, not for satisfying of any law. Because as soon as it becomes satisfying a law, the Bible says the law will inflame in you sin. And as soon as you take something that is supposed to be a blessing and you turn it into a law, that law will inflame sin in you and sin, when it is finished, will bring forth death. That says obedience is better than sacrifice. Okay? So to do it is better than not to do it. To submit your flesh is better than to not do it. Now, you know, I'll, but let me use this as an example. If, let's say I'm going to put a dollar in this offering basket. And so I get out my wallet and I fumble around and I find that single and I squeeze it until the little president starts to squeal. And then I get the good God! And I jump in and I get 10 cents back out because I'm going to get some change out of that deal. And I say, ah! Go away! Go away! Ah! I mean, you know, if I give offering like that, what good did it do me? Not one good. I've been there. Not a drop. <laughs> it absolutely not a drop. <laughs> And it would be no different than this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cast this on to Mark and Jacqueline because they're sitting right there snuggled up together. So they're making me a good example tonight. So let's say tomorrow morning Jacqueline has found a yard sale. It is the A number one yard sale of the year. She's got stars and asterisks and got it circled in the paper. And she says to Mark, Mark, I want you to take me to this yard sale. This is the one right here. Been waiting on this all year. He says, fine. I'll take you. So she gets him out of bed. He her the whole time. And he throws his shoes on the floor. And he puts them on. He runs out. And he's honking the horn out there in the parking lot. Come on, woman. Let's get this over with. The whole time, grabs bones and complains while they're there. Before it's done, what good did that do? Not a drop. As a matter of fact, before it's done, she's going to be saying, I wish you had what? Just stayed home. Yeah, exactly right. And that, so we can associate that with what we're talking about here. To build relationship, if Mark, even if Mark didn't want to go, there is an attitude with which he could go and it still strengthened the relationship isn't, even though it wasn't what he wanted to do. And there is a way that I can pull my scripture out, even if it's not what my flesh wants to do that in that moment. There is a way I can still pull it out against the desire of my flesh and open it and read it and do it with a sweet spirit about the fact that I am doing it even though I didn't want to at the moment. There is a way to do that. And it will benefit your relationship with the Father when you do it that way. In response to Jared's question there, if, if I was going through that situation and I'm struggling to pick up my word and do it anyways, but the reason I did it is because I was struggling and I knew my answer was in there, wouldn't that be different from if I was just doing it 
For law. So what you were talking about. If for you're law. doing it for law, you're, you're, you're going wrong. Yeah. Let me read Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, then 23 through 24. Romans chapter 4. What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? If Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that works is the reward not reckoned of grace but debt. Look at this. Abraham was not righteous because he carried Isaac up on the mountain. Abraham was not righteous because he carried Abraham Isaac back down off the mountain. Abraham was not righteous because of one single thing that he did. He wasn't righteous because he left his daddy. He wasn't righteous because he walked across that land. He wasn't righteous because he had a son in his old age. None of that made him righteous. Not one ounce of works made Abraham righteous. The only thing that made Abraham righteous is this statement. Abraham believed God. Jump to verse 23. Now it, was, now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him righteousness by believing, but for you also to whom it shall be imputed. If we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, listen to me, Abraham could not do one single work that made him righteous and that word was imputed to every single person under the sound of my voice. You are not righteous because of your works. You are righteous because you believe in the work that Jesus Christ did. I am not righteous because I prayed more. I am not righteous because I've read more. I am not righteous because I've attended more. I am not righteous because I've done any one single work. I am righteous by the blood of Jesus Christ because He died, He resurrected, I believe it, therefore I am righteous. No other reason are you righteous. You will not. Listen to me. There are going to be a great number of people who are going to walk in front of the throne room of God and they are going to stand before Him and He is going to say, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. And they are going to say, But we in the streets, we healed the sick. We cast out devils. We raised the dead. We did great and mighty works. And He's going to say, What? I never knew you. Why did he not know them? Because they established their righteousness on works and not on faith. If all they had to do was stand in front of Jesus and not account for their works, but if they had stood in front of the, of the judge, the just judge at that moment, and he said, what about it? And they said, I believe on the work of your son, his death on the cross and his resurrection. And I accepted his blood as the washing away of my sins. I believed with everything that was within me. He would have said then, enter in my good and my faithful servant. But because they said works, 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 works. They thought they were saved by their works. They thought they were going in by their works. They thought they were going to make it to heaven by their works. If the rapture happens Saturday morning about daylight and the trumpet blows and you rely on your works, be sure and roll the air conditioners down when you get here. I won't be here Sunday morning. <laughs> the first thing I do is roll the air conditioners down when I get here. Because you won't get in by your works. You're only going to get in by faith. By faith we are saved through grace. That not of ourselves, it is a gift from God. When, when posed with the idea of being a better Christian. How many people say, if I were to go say, Tony, what, is, what are you going to do to be a better Christian? You know what? Almost invariably every single person of the last one will say to one of these things. More church, more Bible, more prayer, uh, more, more something, something, more, 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 do, 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 more, do, more, do, do, more, do, more, do, more. But you know, I've not ever one time 
had anybody ever say to me, I wish I had loved him more and harder and deeper. Everybody, when you talk to them about being a better Christian, will talk to you about more do, do more, do more, do more, until we have made ourselves an anxious bundle of nerves because there's only 24 hours in a day and we can't figure out how to get an hour squeaked out for him because they're so busy and we get this in our mind. If I'm not doing more, I'm losing my righteousness. And we forget that my righteousness came free by the blood of Jesus Christ. He made me righteous. And if I could answer the question, if, if I, what would it take to make me a better Christian? If I can answer it with, I want to love him more. I want to pursue him more. I want a stronger relationship with him. I want to love him deeper. The rest will take care of itself. If I love with abandon, I'll find time. If I love with abandon, I'll read his love letter to me. How many of you ever, uh, I'll talk to all the men uh, in this room that's old enough to remember life before texting. Life before texting. How many men in this room, you ever got a letter passed to you by your girlfriend while you was in high school and you just threw it in your locker, slammed the door shut on it and just completely forgot about it and didn't read it? No. What you did was the first chance you got, you ran and found a place to hide and you unfolded that letter and one of your buddies would try to run by and grab it to aggravate you and you'd get in a fist fight over it to get it back. Right? Why? Because you was in love with that little girl and you wanted to know what she had to say to you. Even if it was absolutely nothing, you still wanted to know what she had to say. And if we are that much in love with Father, we will want to open up His letter to us and see what does He have to say to me? What has He said? And all of a sudden, Reading his book becomes a, a great thing and a, the thing that I desire. And I find I always want to go to it because I want to find out what this one who loved me more than I even loved myself had to say to me. Yes. And I begin to find time because I love him. Romans chapter 3, verse 20 through 26. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, everybody say works. works. Say the deeds of the law are works. Therefore, by works, there shall no flesh be justified. For by the law, everybody say works. works. Therefore, by the works, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For works is the knowledge of sin. Whoa, time out. In works is the knowledge of what? What does that say? In works is the what? Well, let me ask you this question. Was the law good or evil? Good. The law was good. It came from God. Nothing evil comes from God. Was the law good or evil? It was good. Well, let's try that again. Was the law good or evil? Good. The law was good. It came from God. It was designed to bring those people up to the day that Jesus was going to die on the cross. The law was good. So would you say the deeds of something good are good or evil? Good. Gotta be good, right? But this says, therefore, the, by the deeds or the works of the law, no flesh will be justified, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. How could that even be possible? Well, I want to ask this question. How many people in this room are perfect? How many men in this room have done every single thing their wife asked them for the last 30 days? I was looking to see if there's any men here without their wives because that would be the only ones that would answer that with a hand raise <laughs> if their wives weren't here to watch. And the reason is, is because nobody's perfect. How is it possible that the works of something good, which would be good works, could possibly be the knowledge of sin? And here's how it is. Because you realize real quick you can't do it good enough. That's right. 
You can't do it good enough. And so what I find is, the harder I try to do good, the more I find to do evil is within me. And I find myself standing with Paul in Romans chapter 7. The good that I would do, I don't do. And the bad that I wish I wouldn't do, I find myself doing all the time. Oh, wretched man that I am, what am I going to do with this? But... Thanks be unto God, by Jesus Christ our Lord, there is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the <laughs> works of the flesh, but by the grace of the Spirit. Because the more I try to find my righteousness by works, the more sin I'm going to do. Because I'm going to continually discover that the minute I say I'm going to read an hour every day, you can count on it. You're losing already. The instant you promise yourself you're going to pray an hour every day, you're losing already. Not that you shouldn't make goals. I'm not saying that you shouldn't make goals. But the instant I turn it into a law, what I'm going to define is my own weakness. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the works is manifest. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all of them that believe, there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. How many have heard that one quoted? Yes. We take it out of context. For all have come short of the glory of God. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What does that mean? We've all tried to get to him by works. Yes, sir. This scripture where it says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It means we've all tried to come into the glory of God by works. At times we've established works mentality, works in our heart, works in our hands. But please jump up one verse. Can we go back to verse 22 again? Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Jesus Christ. Listen to me. I want to make a profound statement to every single person that's not in this room. You are the righteousness of God. God in Christ. Amen. Every single person under the sound of my voice, if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior by faith, you are righteous. You are righteous. That means you are in right standing. You are not unworthy. You are righteous by the blood of Jesus Christ, not by works. That means this coming Sunday, next coming Sunday morning, when we're all gathered around up here, the Spirit starts moving and we start laying hands on the sick, guess what? The word is that you're going to hear inside your head when I call for the soldiers well-armed and member ministers of the day and heroes of faith for this generation, inside of your head there's going to be a little alarm bell go off and you're going to hear, unworthy, unworthy. <laughs> right? And the reason it's going to happen is because if the enemy can keep you in your seat, then he can be victorious. But you are the righteousness of God in Christ by the blood of Jesus Christ. You have the full ability to retain the fire of God on you as a bush to see the works of God performed before you. Why? Because you are saved by grace through the righteousness of the blood of Jesus Christ. You have full access to the throne room of God, to the table that is spread in splendor. You have full access to it every time by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. If I had my board out here, I'd draw a big triangle upside down with a point at the bottom. And it would say body, soul, and spirit. That's works mentality. The spirit being in subjection to the soul and the flesh. And that's you trying to keep your mind in order and your body in order. And your spirit being succumbed to that. Right here beside it, I would draw with it right side up. And I'd have the spirit at the top. And I'd have the soul and the body across the bottom. And I would tell you that is you with faith righteousness. How do I get those triangles flipped over? And it's all about faith righteousness. As long as you are considering works making you righteous, you will never, listen to me, as long as you are counting on your works to make you righteous, you will never have spiritual ascendancy. Won't happen. I'll give you proof. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there is no flesh justified, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. 
Works will always keep your spirit down. And it elevates your soul and your body to a position it is not supposed to be in. But if you will accept salvation by the blood of Jesus Christ to make you holy, to make you righteous, to give you full access to the throne, I can hear some of you thinking out there right now, I am, I am running against your, uh, you, the, the thoughts of your own mind like I, I was running into that wall wide open. Your head is arguing with me wide open right this minute. You're saying, he don't know what he's talking about. He don't know who I am. He don't know what I've done. He don't know how many mistakes I've made in my life. He don't know how many times I've aggravated God. And he don't know how mad God is at me. Well, you listen to me. God is not mad at you. He loved you when you were yet a sinner. Sent his son to die on you. Gave you full access by faith. It doesn't matter where you've been, what you've done, how many times you thought you frustrated, or how mad you thought God was at you. He's not mad. He's not frustrated. He's madly in love with you. He opened up the door of heaven for you. He has fully given you His grace to make you righteous, and you're not unworthy. You have full power to walk straight into the throne of grace, come boldly before the throne of grace, where you can find help in time of trouble. Why? Because you are saved by grace, not works. Amen. You're not saved by your works. Your works are not going to get you there. Your works are not going to... Listen to me. You will never be good enough that this Sunday morning you can lay hands on the sick and see them recover. You'll never be good enough to lay hands on somebody and still filled with the Holy Ghost. You'll never be good enough to raise the dead. You'll never be good enough to heal a leper. You'll never be good enough to lead one soul to salvation. Never be good enough for any of that. Thank the Lord. I, and to me, that's a freeing statement. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I'll never be good enough to do any of that so I can give up trying. And just accept the fact that I am saved by grace. I am righteous by blood. I can't make myself righteous. I can't make myself holy. So I accept the holiness and the righteousness of Jesus Christ as He has made me holy and righteous. And then when I come into the contact with somebody who needs the fire, I can be a bush burning and allow the fire of the Holy Ghost to flow through me into them and see them change. Not by works. Not by works. And all of you are saying, wow, the preacher just told me I can quit reading my Bible. He just told me I can quit praying. He just told me I don't have to fast anymore. Woo, look out, chicken leg. Here I come. That's not what I said. You see what I said a while ago is we've got to be real careful. Works righteousness is this. I work, 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 work to make myself righteous. But there are works of righteousness that because I'm righteous, I do works. Because I'm madly in love with my wife, there's things I do around the house. Yes. Not to stay in her good graces, but just because I love her. Amen. Just because I appreciate her. Just because I value her. There are things I do. Because she's my friend. I, there's things I do. There's time I spend with her. Because we are, because, you know, of that relationship. And so, does, does my relationship change my works? You bet it does. But will my works build relationship? Absolutely not. As a matter of fact, works will destroy relationship. It will not build relationship. Relationship changes my works. But if I become work, 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 work minded, here's what will happen. I'll use marriage relationship as an example. Mark's home. Jacqueline had to work late. So he gets it all built up in his mind. He's done pulled out some steaks. He's got them thawed. He's got everything cooked up. The taters fried. The steaks are on the table. He's lit some candles. He's got it all lined out. And he's already got in his mind. She's going to walk in. She's going to see those steaks and those candles. She's going to swoon. Oh, Mark, you are my hero, my knight in shining armor. And she is going to smother him with the love. And it's just going to be a great evening. Well, I mean, and then, but here's what happens. She walks in. She doesn't see the steaks that are cooked. She don't care if there's candles there because there's seven loads of laundry that didn't get folded. There's still trash rolling down the trash can in the floor. And she walks in saying, why isn't the laundry folded? Why is there still trash in the floor? And I told you to pick up the underwear out of the bathroom. <laughs> well, because Mark had established in his mind what would happen because of his works. Yeah. 
it all comes crumbling down just like that. And he finds himself offended because of how she responded. Because he built up in his mind how she would react to his works. And we do God the exact same way. We build up in our mind how God's going to react to our works. I'm going to read. I'm going to pray. I'm going to fast. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And then God's going to do this and this and this and this because I've done all this stuff. So this is exactly what God's going to do. And we do all ours. And then all of a sudden, all the stuff that we thought God was going to do just didn't happen. And we find ourselves offended because what we find is he didn't ask us to cook the steaks, light the candles, Fry the taters. What he asked us to do was carry out the trash, fold the laundry, pick up our underwear out of the bathroom. And we ignored all of them. You see, you see what I'm talking about? So if we're not real careful, that's how works mentality can get in the way. We start building up these things of works in our mind, and we are convinced that we are manipulating God by our works. And I will assure you, you'll lose every time when you start trying to manipulate God. And that's what our works mentality is really good at. Jerry. Yes. I really do, down deep. And I used to just want to, I, like the work deal, want to work, 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 work. And by the way, what you said about the stuff deal, yes. that is very disappointing how that falls apart on you. Yes, it is. <laughs> it's like a, a part of the church, it's bad. Yes, it is a bad deal. <laughs> but anyway, I just want to believe inside I just want to believe it's not for work. I want to feel the, not acceptance, I know the word acceptance, but I want to feel like I'm pleasing. Yes. Like father and son. Yes. You want to leave your dad. You want yes. To be proud of you. Yes. Is that wrong? No. See what he just said is, I, I want to feel like I please God. Yes. I want to feel like I please God. So I want to. Everybody, need, you get need to get out a piece of paper. You need to write number one. Right? It's these preachers fix tell us how to please God. All right. So get ready. Step number one: believe in Jesus. Number two: believe in Jesus. Number three. Believe in Jesus. Number four, believe in Jesus. You see, after that, let me, let me read you this scripture. Romans chapter 3, verse 26. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just. And the justifier of him who believes in Jesus. What Jared just said is, I want to be justified in the eyes of my king. I want him to look at me and say, that's a good boy. Yes, sir. Now listen to this, that God might be just and the justifier of him which believes in Jesus. If you want to impress God, believe in his son. If you want to catch his attention, believe in his son. If you want brownie points from heaven, believe in Jesus. If you want to, to feel like you're pleasing Abba, believe in Jesus. Step one, two, three, four. Believe in Jesus. And again, everybody's going, cha-ching, cha-ching. I don't have to read my Bible. I don't have to fast. I'm not saying that. I, what I've said is, you will find yourself longing and making opportunity to pray because you believe in Jesus. Yes. And you've got such a relationship that you want time with him. You'll find yourself as you begin to believe in Jesus and trust in faith righteousness. Now you'll want to read your Bible because now you're so in love with Abba that you really want to see what he said. Yes. <clears throat> Entirely different story. Charles. Yes, uh, it seems like, simply put, if you work because you love God, if you work for him because you love him, uh, that's good. If you work for him to get his attention to make him love you, then that's bad. Exactly. If you're, if the whole point of your works are to convince him to love you, to manipulate him into loving you, bad. bad. If you love him, therefore you work. Good. Yeah, that's an easy way to put it. I, I should have let you say that 15 minutes ago. Because <laughs> that's a perfect way to put that. If you're working to manipulate him into loving you, bad. But if you're so in love with him that you're doing works for him, just because you want to, because you love him so much, good. So if the rapture is going to happen before we get home tonight, what do you need to know? Have 
faith in Jesus. There is only one litmus test for the book of life. Only one litmus test for the book of life. Jesus Christ, faith in Jesus Christ by the blood to set you free. That's it. Everything else does not get you in the book of life. Now, I'm not, again, remember, I didn't tell you not to read your Bible. I didn't tell you not to pray. I didn't tell you not to fast. I didn't tell you not to pursue him. What I said was believe in Jesus first. Completely throw away the fact that your works are going to get you anything from God. And remember, you got everything from God by Jesus' works. And then from that, build relationship. From that, build relationship. Every single thing you have received from God because Jesus did the works. You had nothing from God because you did the works. Full access by faith. Now, build relationship. Does that make sense? Mark? I've got to ask this. Is there a scripture in Matthew, I thought it was 23, 25, somewhere around there, that says we will be returned, measured for what we, and I know that there's something like this, but it would be completely contrary to what, with what you're saying here. But the scripture you talk about whatever measure you measure will be measured back unto you again. Remember that scripture on whatever measure you measure will be measured back to you again is talking about uh, forgiveness and brotherly love. So, and, and judging my neighbor. With whatever measure I measure judging my neighbor, that same measure will be measured back to me. You know, if my next door neighbor has nothing, to do with works. has nothing to do with works, it's judging my neighbor. And with whatever measuring stick I measure him, I'm going to be measured by the same measuring stick. Yeah. Anybody else? Anita? I love what you said one time uh, when you were talking about Luke, as a matter of fact, that the authority. Because he is your son. As children, we grow up wanting to please our parents, and in the flesh, we're always trying to gain something from our family, you know, appreciation. But because Luke is your son, he didn't have to work for right. that authority. And I love that because that's who I am in Christ. And yes. I forget that sometimes. Yes, ma'am, right there. A yes. lot of times yes. I forget mm -hmm. that I The enemy wants to want you to forget it. Maybe That's right. He doesn't have to earn that. Time. That's exactly and right. I forget that because I think flesh. Everything yeah. he just said is not talking. You know what I'm saying? Everything here. Exactly right. <laughs> because the, the enemy wants to convince you to works. But the whole time the spirit is saying, don't do it, don't do it. You're worthy, you're worthy, you're worthy. Huh? Romans 14, 22, verse 4, your main scripture. Yep. Happy is he who does not condemn himself for what he does. If your heart don't condemn you. Yep. Happy is he who does not condemn himself. What makes me condemn myself? Works mentality. Works mentality. Father, I thank you for this people. I thank you for your word that sets us free. Father, I declare for everybody under the sound of my voice, we are not slave to sin because we're not slave to works. I declare, Father, we are slaves to righteousness by choice because we accept righteousness by the blood of Jesus Christ, free from works. Tonight, Father, as every person leaves this room, I pray that they will be able to take a deep breath of peace, that there will be a calm in the storm of life deep in their heart as they are able to just rest in this. I am saved by grace with full access because I'm worthy. Father, cause that to ring in their ears the rest of this week. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. God bless each and every one of you. Lord willing, I'll see you right here.